Now, <clears throat> we talked about structures of DNA and RNA, and I want to remind you, just briefly, about the genome, the comparative sizes, the genome, and what genome, genotype, phenotype constitutes. As we discussed before, phenotype, the physical characteristics of bacteria, it can be shape of bacteria, it can be size, it can be color, <coughs> sorry, it can be color of the of colonies, shape of the colonies, presence or absence of flagellum, uh, resistance to antibiotics, ability to cause the disease, all of it are phenotypical traits. Now, genome is basically uh, an entire set of genes that you find in a certain cell. It's a cellular genome. And different genomes, so say E. coli has a certain genome, say that particular strain of E. coli has a certain genotype, meaning it has a certain set of genes. <clears throat> Another strain of E. coli is going to have slightly different set of genes, different genotypes. Uh, remember our uh, correction to the statement genotype defines phenotype. It's not all genes that define it. It's the genes that are expressed at a certain time in the certain circumstances that define a phenotype. We did that experiment with serratium recessans before when we demonstrated that serratia uh, develops red colonies at the room temperature and colorless 37. So that exemplifies that in different environmental conditions, genotype will produce different phenotypes because of the differential gene expression. And when we say gene expression, we're essentially <clears throat> talking about that process. What we call <clears throat> sometimes <coughs> A central dogma of molecular biology. Now the word dogma doesn't really belong to science, uh, but the name stuck, although there are some um, other processes that can happen, it's not essentially a dogma, but for our intents and purposes, for now, I want you to know it I can't stress out how important the simple sequence is. DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated into protein. <clears throat> I expect you to know it right now. That's it. Okay? So, before we move on and discuss different aspects of gene expression, I want to briefly mention the comparative sizes. Of micro of genomes for different organisms. Generally speaking, viruses have the smallest genomes. Um, hepatitis D virus is the smallest human virus with a genome of 1700 nucleotides. Then we have bacteria. Usually it's a few million nucleotides, a few million base pairs. Then we have single-celled eukaryotes, like fungi and protozoa. So here we're talking about tens of millions of base pairs. And then we have higher organisms, multicellular eukaryotes, uh, plants, animals, humans, helmets. Of course, uh, first of all, you don't need to memorize any numbers here. But if I give you a list, and I ask you which organism has the smallest genome or the largest genome, you have to pick one from the list. Am I clear? Uh, why I say it's, you know, it's like differential, uh, something that I discovered quite recently, the organism with the largest genome turns out to be some kind of amoeba. single cell protozoa having the largest genomes, several tens of billions of base pairs. Why? We don't know. Enormous. So, <clears throat> the DNA, the genomes, how, 
what structure do they take when they are in the cell? DNA in the cell exists in the form of a chromosome, right? So main difference between bacterial and eukaryotic chromosomes is that bacterial chromosomes are circular and eukaryotic chromosomes are linear. Now when we say circular, it doesn't mean that it has a shape of a perfect circle. It means that bacterial chromosome has no loose ends. Usually bacterial cells have one chromosome, rarely two. Eukaryotic cells usually have more than one chromosome. DNA in the chromosome like this, or like this, doesn't exist in a free form. Turns out the DNA in the chromosomes is bound to proteins that are called histones in eukaryotes and histone-like proteins in bacteria. Now if you want to imagine what it looks like, imagine that this is a schematic representation of a histone and double-stranded DNA will be wrapped around the histone like a thread around the spool. Does that make sense? Is that clear? So obviously when DNA is wrapped around like this, genes that are present in this DNA molecule cannot be expressed because they are bound to a histone. Only when DNA is unwrapped and stretched out, genes present on a certain fragment of DNA on a certain chromosome can be expressed. Does that make sense? Think of it as, think of the histone as the bookshelf. When DNA is wrapped around histone, it's like a book in the bookshelf. It's there, but you can't read it. You have to take it out. You have to unwrap DNA from the histone. You have to take the book out and open it. Does that make sense? So essentially, histones regulate gene expression. Different enzymes can chemically modify histones, okay, or histone-like proteins, allowing DNA to bind and dissociate from the histones. Is that clear? So basically, you have some external enzymes that take the book off the shelf or put it back there. And by regulating the activity of these enzymes, cell can regulate the gene expression for a significant amount of genes. Makes sense, right? Now, interestingly enough, it turns out that in human cell, <coughs> Histones are capable not only of regulating the activity of human genes, but they can also regulate the activity of viruses that leave their DNA inside the nucleus. Uh, turns out that histones can successfully, it's called silencing, so they can, can shut down the uh, gene expression from genes of HIV. And it's, it, it is a really a complicated process. Sometimes they can shut down. HIV tries to counteract it. But histones have really uh, a critical role in regulation of the gene expression in the human bacterial, well, in bacteria is going to be histone-like proteins in eukaryotic cells. Are we clear? Now, which chromosome? contains a lot of non-coding DNA. Now, this non-coding DNA, shown in blue, can be found, first and foremost, in eukaryotic cells. So you look at the eukaryotes and you discover that, in, in fact, majority of the DNA in the chromosome 
does not encode for any proteins. For a long time, we used to call this non-coding DNA. You may have heard this term, junk DNA. Um, this term is used less and less now because it turns out many of that non-coding DNA structures are actually regulatory. So it was a little bit arrogant to call it junk without knowing the actual function. DNA in both bacterial and eukaryotic cells can exist in the extra chromosomal form. In eukaryotes, extra chromosomal DNA, as we mentioned before, can be found in mitochondria and chloroplasts. In bacteria and archaea, in prokaryotes, extra chromosomal DNA can be found in the structures called plasmids, circular double strand DNA molecules, not really big in size, uh, that may carry certain, let's call them just traits. What is important about plasmids? They aren't essential for the cell survival. Okay? So, look at Bacillus anthracis cell on the right. It turns out that two toxins that largely contribute to the virulence of Bacillus anthracis that define what kind of disease Bacillus anthracis causes, meaning anthrax, these plasmids can be removed from the cell and this modified Bacillus anthracis will lose a significant portion of its virulence. It will not be as deadly as it used to be with plasmids. Does that make sense? Now, plasmids may not necessarily carry the genes essential for virulence, for disease. One of the biggest concerns of the modern clinical microbiology are the plasmids that carry antibiotic resistance. It turns out that plasmids can be fairly easily exchanged between different bacterial cells. Therefore, presence of antibiotic resistant antibiotic resistance gene on the plasmid is a huge concern for medical professionals because it means that this plasmid will spread through the bacterial population like a wildfire. Plasmids can carry genes encoding certain metabolic proteins, enabling microorganisms to use new substrates as for nutrient you know, production or for energy production. Now, the important thing is that all DNA that is found in the bacterial cell, plasmids, genome, will be transferred from generation to generation in the process of DNA replication. Does that make sense? So every time cell divides, its DNA content will be copied into the new cell. It is true for both bacteria and single-celled, dicellar, eukaryotes. But we're going to be focusing on bacterial gene expression, okay, in our future discussions. One thing that I want to tell, so bacterial gene expression is relatively straightforward. We're going to be touching very, you know, we're going to draw it in a very large, you know, brush strokes. We're not going to talk about various regulatory factors. The whole idea of gene expression in eukaryotes is very similar. There are a lot of regulatory elements, more enzymes, but the general idea is the same. Does that make sense? We're good? Which brings us to the first step of gene expression, transcription of the DNA. The result of DNA transcription is the RNA molecule. So what is going on? The enzyme called RNA polymerase 
shown on the right. You don't need to memorize the uh, subunits. There are five. Two alpha subunits, beta, beta prime, and sigma subunit. So that's a great example of the quaternary structure of the protein. This protein is functional only when five subunits hold together. So this protein, RNA polymerase, binds to the DNA template. DNA template must be double-stranded. It turns out transcription cannot occur on the single strand of a DNA. Does that make sense? How does the RNA polymerase know where to bind? It turns out in the beginning of, of a gene, uh, sometimes in the beginning of the whole set of genes, there is a structure, DNA sequence, called a promoter. Here, yellow highlight shows a short fragment of the promoter located at the beginning of the gene. I don't know, it's, it's really hard to see, I know, but I can tell you this here is the number one. It um, delineates the first nucleotide that is actually nucleotide of a gene, not the promoter. Does that make sense? Everything that is before uh, is numbered negatively. So negative 10, negative 35, those are positions before the actual gene starts. I usually compare the promoter to the title of a book chapter. When you read a book and you want to read, I don't know, uh, say you read, you read a microbiology textbook and you want to read about viruses. So find a title that has viruses in the name. It doesn't tell you anything about viruses, right? It just tells you from here, you're going to read about viruses. Promoter doesn't give you any proteins. It just tells RNA polymerase. Bind here if you want to produce, I don't know, metabolic proteins. So you want to produce um, antibiotic resistance proteins, whatever. We clear? So RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. You don't need to memorize the key regions. Uh, I'm sorry, just really dear to my heart. That was my term project in college. Very last when I was studying the interaction between bacterial RNA polymerase and the promoter. Okay. Now when it binds, it unzips the DNA. You can see better the unzipping in this picture. So this is one strand of DNA. I highlight it in blue. This is another. So you see only double-stranded DNA. Make sense? This beige oval represents RNA polymerase. And this red molecule here represents freshly synthesized RNA molecule. What can you notice from this image? First, <clears throat> how many RNA strands are produced? One. So despite the fact that RNA polymerase read, uh, binds to double-stranded DNA, it produces single-stranded RNA, only one strand. Does that make sense? Because it reads only one DNA strand as well, which is called a template strand. Does that make sense? So RNA polymerase will bind to double-stranded DNA molecule, read only one strand from 3 to 5 prime end, you do need to know that. I mentioned it before. DNA is always read from 3 to 5 prime. And as the result of that reading, as the result of transcription, RNA polymerase will produce a 
single strand RNA. Does that make sense? Are we clear about it? It reads, it only binds to double stranded DNA. It reads one strand of that double stranded DNA, which is called a template strand, and it produces single strand RNA molecule. Now, <clears throat> you see that DNA is unzipped, and you see unzipping here. This unzipping is often called a transcription bubble, okay? And this transcription bubble will move towards the end of the gene as transcription proceeds. So the step when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter and unzips the DNA is called initiation. When RNA polymerase starts to consistently produce RNA, the step is called elongation. When RNA polymerase runs into the so-called terminal repeats at the end of the gene, RNA polymerase essentially start, starts to stalling, like stuttering, and eventually falls off the gene. This is the termination of transcription. Yes? So, a non-template strain that's not being read, is that, like, unstable? Does that mean no. Nothing. Nothing. That's actually a good question, because... I noticed, and it's not you, it's not anybody in this room, it's everybody in this room, including me. We try to find logical explanation, because it seems completely counterintuitive that you have two strands that carry essentially identical information, and yet only one RNA is produced, second strand is not used. Well, there are reasons. Think about this. You have two strands, two books, right? One book is written from three prime to five prime. But if you read it from three prime to five prime, this strand, that you will have to read another backwards. So it's not going to give you an actual RNA mole, uh, an actual proper RNA molecule. Does that make sense? But this explanation, it's like, you know, we try to make up something, maybe this is what. But in fact, it's sort of a law we noticed there is there's we don't know of any situation when single stranded dna can be transcribed that's what happens in nature does that make sense Uh -huh. it, it's there. Interesting fact. DNA in living organisms is always double-stranded, right? But viruses, some viruses like parvovirus, can have single-stranded DNA genome. And they need genes to be transcribed in order to produce viral proteins. It turns out that first thing that they have to do is to make a copy of the single-stranded DNA to complete the double-stranded structure, which then can be transcribed. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a first step that they have to go through. Yeah. No, they do it only in the host cell. As far as I remember, they even use the host DNA polymerase to do it. Which actually gives you an idea that uh, I like the expression, nature is extremely bureaucratic, inefficient, and redundant. If something works, it's going to work. Like, if it doesn't cost an organism uh, enormous fitness disadvantage, eh, it's fine. Okay, I always give students examples with humans. If you look at the human eye, it's terrible. It's awful. But it works. So when 
when some other organisms start to destroy us, maybe, but so far, it's totally fine. That makes sense? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I, yeah, I refer, I refer to um, giant squids. They have best eyes in the world. But we don't, we don't need them. Okay, just, just don't. Now, RNA synthesized. Good. This is a message. It carries a message. Okay. The next step that I wanted to talk about, called splicing, occurs in eukaryotes and viruses, but isn't found in archaea or bacteria. Remember, we mentioned that uh, a huge portion of the eukaryotic DNA is non-coding. Okay? In humans, for instance, non-coding DNA constitutes about 90% of the entire piece. Okay? That makes sense? So, when DNA is transcribed into RNA molecule, not only coding fragments called exons, but also non-coding fragments called introns are transcribed. Does that make sense? So in eukaryotes, this RNA, this product of transcription, will undergo the process of splicing. Okay? Now, on the very simple level, how does it work? Imagine that the blue is the intron bound by two coding exons. Are you following me? So what's going to happen? This molecule will form so-called lariat structure. You see? Now the ends of exons approach each other right here. This loop is excised and you have proper DNA molecule that can see, uh, proper mRNA molecule without introns just with two exons. Does that make sense? So, um, this is what I'm talking about. If you look at this wire, my fingers bound the intron in the center. It's bent like this. Okay, this loop is cut out, and the exon stitched together. Got it? So this loop, does it have genes on it that are just nope. discarded? Just discarded. We don't know. We we have no idea why why introns. Some genes may have just a couple. Some genes may have four or five introns. Different organisms have different percentage. Uh, I believe that the DNA with the uh, the eukaryotic DNA with the least amount of junk, as far as I remember, it's pufferfish. I have no idea why. I don't know. Nobody knows. It just was discovered. Maybe there is an organism that we didn't sequence yet, which has even less. So far, it's a buffer fish. Okay? So, there is no... That shows you nature is redundant. It doesn't have to be super optimized. It's fine. As long as the organism survives, it's fine. Does that make sense? So, in this illustration... You can see that, you know, DNA here is transcribed into RNA. We usually call it pre-mRNA, which then undergoes splicing and produces mRNA. Now, there is such a thing as alternative splicing, meaning that not all exons are going to be present 
in the final molecule of mRNA. So, for instance, look at this gene. How many exons does it have? Five. five. So, this mRNA on the left also has five <coughs> exons stitched together. And it produces this functional protein. Now, the mRNA here has only four exons. It's missing number three. So if you compare protein A and protein B, you will see that there is a little part here missing. So it is possible that protein B and protein A are both functional, but for instance, protein B can be found in different membrane, in different location. It may lose some of the function, but not all the function. Does that make sense? Here, protein C misses number four, exon number four. So all these three proteins are similar, but they are also slightly different. This one, protein C, is missing this part. <coughs> okay. Now, why it's important? It allows organisms, eukaryotic organisms, and, turns out, viruses to produce more than one functional protein from a single gene. Does that make sense? I'm going to use a, an example that I've worked on briefly. <clears throat> Humans have, it allows eukaryotes and viruses to produce more than one functional protein from the single gene. In human cells, not only human cells, mammalian, mouse cells, there is a protein called thyridoxin reductase. Never mind the function, but the point is, it has two forms. It has cytoplasmic form, found in cytoplasm, and it has nuclear form, found in the nucleus. These forms are slightly different, is the result of alternative splicing. As far as I remember, nuclear form is a little smaller. Does that make sense to you? Now, I want to highlight again, splicing does not happen in the bacteria or archaea. It is a unique feature for eukaryotes and, surprisingly, viruses. Interestingly, it was discovered in adenovirus, and then it was discovered in other Initially, it was discovered in viruses. Are we clear on that? Which brings us to the conversation about genetic code, translation, and protein synthesis. So, how does genetic code work? So, DNA and RNA are essentially texts, okay? They have letters, as any text does. Those are nucleotides, A, U, G, and C in the RNA. These letters compose words, call those words codons. Each individual codon encodes an amino acid. And I mentioned before that all proteins, all of them, can, may contain 21 different kind of amino acid. Does that make sense? So essentially, you have to have enough words, enough codons, to cover 21 amino acid. If you will make codons consisting of two letters, say AU or GU, that will give you only 16 combinations, which is not enough to encode for 21. So codons consist of three letters, all of them. This is the law of nature. Genetic code is three-lettered codons. Does that make sense? Now, if you would look at them, you will see that 
one amino acid, say leucine, can be encoded by more than one codon. UUA stands for leucine, UUG, CUU, CUC, and six codons, in fact, mean leucine. Does that make sense? In um, analogous to language, we're talking about synonyms. <laughs> So I can call something huge, big, grand, large, enormous, gigantic. Does that make sense? It's all the same, right? There is a little different, different smell to each word. I will probably like, uh, uh, I will use something like, uh, I don't know, huge building, okay, or large building, but a uh, big boy. But in general, if I say, oh, this is a big building, you will still get me. Understand? So, not all amino acids have these synonyms, but many do. So, that, that feature of genetic code, that each amino acid may be encoded, I should add, may be encoded by more than one codon is called redundancy. Genetic code is degenerate or redundant. Okay, each amino acid can be encoded or may be encoded by more than one codon. There are a few unique ones. Um, tryptophan is the single codon and methionin is the single codon. These two are just one codon. So AUG is always methionin, and UGG is always tryptophan. Does that make sense? Um, I believe question that kind of boils somewhere in the corner of your mind. Do you need to memorize the codons? God, no. Okay. <coughs> You, I really need you to understand the redundancy of the code, what it is, okay, synonym story. Uh, along with the codons for amino acids, genetic code also has the start codon, which is always AUG. So you see AUG, it is probably a start codon. It's not the only characteristic of the first amino acid in the protein, but the first amino acid in the protein will be methionine, because start codon is AUG. Am I clear? And it encodes for three stop codons. Essentially, stop codon is, it encodes for, you know, termination of the protein synthesis. It's a period at the end of the sentence. Does that make sense? Any questions on the code? Now, we're going to switch gears and we will talk about the whole process of translation, the whole process of the protein synthesis, the very wide brush strokes. So, mRNA, okay, is translated from 5 prime to 3 primes. You see, that's the difference, another difference between RNA and DNA. DNA is always read from 3 to 5. Now, RNA is read from 5 to 3. Ribosomes in prokaryotes and eukaryotes are different in size. These terms, 30S and 50S, 40S and 60S, they show you the size of the ribosomal subunit. If you would look at the shape of the ribosome, it looks something like this. Okay, so this is, say, if it's a bacterial ribosome, it's going to be 30S and it's going to be 50S. Now, these units that describe the size of the subunit, okay, this S, stands for Svedberg, it's not going to be on the exam. They are not additive. So if you add 50 and 30, like in this case, 
you're now going to get 80. The total size of the bacterial ribosome is 70S. Now, I don't like to leave people like in the dark questioning why. So it's not on the exam, but I will explain. These units, Svedbergs, S is Svedberg, named after Swedish guy. They show how fast a molecule or a structure precipitates in the centrifuge. Does that make sense? No? You know what the centrifuge is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Imagine a barrel with a lot of tubes on the edge of the barrel. Got it? You start to rotate it. And due to the, what's the force? Centrifugal force, thank you very much. Due to the centrifugal force, whatever is in those tubes will be pulled down to the bottom. Does that make sense? It's like, you know, you have a bucket with water and you can roll it like this and the water will never spill. Make sense? So the bigger particles will get down first. The smaller particles, second. But the time that it takes for those particles to reach the bottom depends not only on the mass, but also on the shape. Does that make sense? If it's loose, like kind of flat, it's going to take a long time for it to fall down. Like you know that if you take a sheet of paper and you take, I don't know, a stone of the same mass and you drop them from the roof, which one will fall faster? A stone because it's compact, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, it's heavy or anything, it's just more compact. Does that make sense? So the Swedberg units, they take into account not only the size, but also the shape. And they are empirical, you can't really predict. So basically what people do, they spin them down and see what time it takes to, to precipitate a certain structure. Does that make sense? It's just sort of a traditional way to describe. So we know that 50s is more than 30 but they're not additive. Same goes for eukaryotic. So 40 and 60, they don't give you 100. When you put those subunits together, the whole ribosome will be 80s. You see that? Now, you may notice that pro and eukaryotic ribosomes are different. Not functionally, they both responsible for protein synthesis, but structurally. Now, clinically important repercussion of this. If we have two essentially organelles that perform the same job, but are structurally different, we may try to shut down one without shutting down another. So if we can inhibit the function of bacterial ribosome, specifically bacterial, because it's different from human, does that make sense? We may have actually a great drug that would prevent reproduction of bacteria, treat bacterial infections, but will not affect human cells. Guess what? The majority of antibacterial drugs address exactly this problem. Drugs like tetracycline, azithromycin, Lincomycin, clindamycin, um, chloramphenicol, all those drugs inhibit bacterial protein synthesis, barely affecting human life. Does that make sense? Another important consequence of our knowledge about the difference between bacterial and eukaryotic ribosomes is that it kind of confirms that mitochondria used to be a bacteria. Remember mitochondria have ribosomes? Turns out it has bacterial ribosomes. Like you isolate ribosomes from mitochondria, typical, you know, 70S ribosomes, bacterial ones. The rest of the eukaryotic cell is going to have normal eukaryotic. Ribosomes in mitochondria will be bacterial. Now, let's take a look at the pictures addressing the process of gene expression. First, 
Look on the left. This picture has a mistake that I will correct in a second. So this uh, thin blue line, can you see it? I don't know, but I believe the person who selected the colors was colorblind. So this blue line is DNA. This beige oval is RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase produces this mRNA molecule. Does that make sense so far? Turns out, now, in, say, bacterial cell, is there any membrane between the DNA and the cytoplasm? Inside, no. DNA is not separated from the cytoplasm, which means that RNA, that mRNA, is immediately accessible for ribosomes to jump on it and start translating it. Does that make sense? So in this picture, and this is not the DNA, of course, it's a protein. On this picture, you can see that RNA polymerase, the beige oval, transcribes DNA, making mRNA, and while mRNA is still being synthesized, ribosomes, one, two, three, already translate mRNA into a protein. Does that make sense? Now, if you will look at the picture of a larger scale, you will see that this is schematic DNA molecule, presumably double-stranded. Those are RNA polymerase molecules. Believe me, they are there. Color is terrible, but they're there. And each of these RNA polymerase molecules synthesizes its own mRNA. Those mRNA are essentially identical because it's the same gene, right? And this each mRNA has a bunch of ribosomes. This is called polyribosome, bunch of ribosomes bound to mRNA still in the process of synthesis, okay? And each ribosome produces proteins. So in this picture, if we will count 3, 5, 8, uh, 15, it is 23 ribosomes on that picture, each producing a protein. So, you see, it is highly efficient way to synthesize a protein. Does that make sense? Really fast. Bacterial cell can respond um, really quickly to environmental changes, expressing a certain gene and producing protein that is a product of that gene at the very high level. Does that make sense? And here's the deal. The main reason why it can happen is because there is no membrane between the DNA and the cytoplasm. There is no physical separation between the DNA and the ribosomes. In eukaryotes, DNA is in the nucleus, and ribosomes are outside of it. Does that make sense? So RNA has to be transported across the nuclear envelope. Not only this, in eukaryotes, there is splicing. So, in eukaryotes, RNA that is a product of transcription isn't ready to be tr uh, translated. It has to be processed. Does that make sense? So, this process in, in um, eukaryotes is slow. Now, I want to make a little plug out of a digression for what is called OER, or Open Educational Resources. Let me explain what I mean. So, this picture on the left. It has, a, it has a mistake, right? What is supposed to be protein, right here, what I write as a protein. They call it DNA. It's not. It's a protein. But folks that were drawing this, they made a mistake. 
Now, that's, well, it's kind of, you know, somebody may say, well, why do you use this picture? Because it's free. And because it's public license. Oh, come on. I have, I have all publishers' pictures from microbiology textbook. And we used to require it for the course. It's a book by Cohen. It's okay book. Guess what? It also has mistakes. You know what's the difference between the book that I have a link to in my syllabus and that textbook that we used to require? The link in the syllabus is free. The book that we used to require is 200 bucks. I'd rather have a picture with a mistake that I can easily correct for free than I will have to correct mistakes in the pictures from the book for 200 bucks. Think 200 I mean, you can hire some people that will look through, okay, and find those mistakes. So, and importantly, I keep forgetting this, but technically I can write an email to these fellas and tell them you have a, you have a typo on the picture. And they can correct it right away because it's online. There's no printing involved. So, yes. Do you know any website, something like that, you know, that you can recommend us? It's in the syllabus. Like recommended book, it's in the syllabus. If you will go to the uh, page on the blackboard okay. with the syllabus, I will show you during the break. But I rec there is a book that you can read. The book is way more than we need for the course. It, it's very expansive, but it's a really good book. Now, uh, for protein synthesis, what I usually do, so we go, I go over the protein synthesis, uh, you know, drawing and, and scribbling, and then I see completely lost expressions on your faces, and we do some kind of reenactment. And we're going to do reenactment again and again and again because it really helps to understand. Okay? So let's talk about the whole process of translation, the protein synthesis. So first of all, we need to assemble the complex between the, the ribosome, the large subunit, the small subunit, the mRNA, and the tRNA. Speaking of which, I got to go back forgot to explain how amino acids are transported. So amino acids are transported to the ribosome by tRNA, in the right bottom corner. The structure of tRNA is often referred to as the clover leaf. You have one hairpin, second hairpin, third hairpin. Can you see that? Now, this here is the site where amino acid attaches to the tRNA. Does that make sense? It kind of carries it on the tail. Here, on the bottom, is what is called anti-codon loop. So, tRNA anti-codon is complementary to a certain codon in the mRNA. Let's take a look at this specific example. What is the anti-codon? Can you read those letters? CGG. It's complementary to the codon that is GCC. If you find that codon in the table on the right-hand side, GCC encodes for amino acid alanine, which means this tRNA carries alanine on its tail. Does that make sense? Let's say you have a different tRNA. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it schematically, if you don't mind, without any hairpins. So imagine you have tRNA that has anti-codon GGA. So, okay, it's anti-codon. What's going to be the codon complementary to it in the mRNA? CCU. 
CCU encodes prolin. So in the tail, that tRNA will carry prolin. Does that make sense? No? Wait. So it's the one at the end that is the what's being carried? Like the one that's on the... Because the ACC is an allergy. Oh, ACC is just the sequence. ACC is just the... These are nucleotides. Yeah. Don't don't look at them. It okay. doesn't really matter. Okay. Um. I saw no. I don't get it. So I'm trying to think how to explain it better. Okay. Okay. I think I think I may have um, an approach. Let me do it, and then you will tell me if it helps. Okay. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to write a short fragment of RNA here, okay? Okay? So, what is the first codon? AUG. Are we clear? Second, third, cool. Now, first codon, AUG, encodes for amino acid methionine. So tRNA that transports methionine is going to have anti-codon, which is going to be what? UAC. U, A, C. This is tRNA molecule, and at the tail, it's methionine. So far, does that make sense? Just what I write. Okay. Now, next codon, G, U, U, encodes. Okay, and tie codon is C, A, A. So you've got another tRNA, right? Which will carry... Valin. And the third codon, its anti codon will be CUA. And this will be on the tRNA that encodes asparagine. Anti codons are the part of the tRNA. Does that make sense? This is how. proper amino acids arrive to the site of the protein synthesis. Does that make sense? Or it doesn't? It still doesn't. Not really. Okay. Now, think about this. So this is mRNA, right? Okay. So somewhere here is the ribosome. How does the ribosome know which amino acid to insert? When tRNA with this anticodon gets into the synthesis site, anticodon is complementary to the codon. Do you see that? So it will bind really, really well. And for ribosome, it's going to be enough time to incorporate methionine in the sequence. Then ribosome shifts for one nucleotide, uh, for one codon, okay? And here, the next codon is what? Here, GUU. Now, if tRNA, which has completely uncomplementary anti-codon will arrive, it's not going to stick around. Does that make sense? So every time, if the tRNA that comes into the site of the synthesis has a complementary anti-codon, it will stick around, the amino acid will get incorporated. If, it's, if anti-codon is not complementary, tRNA will just leave. Does that make sense? Is it better? Good. 
Are we more or less clear on the topic? Cool. So this actually kind of illustration, this whole thing is fairly stochastic process. So these tRNAs, it's not like, you know, uh, in the ribosome, there's tiny little oompa loompa that pulls the correct tRNAs from the cytoplasm. Make sense? So tRNA can arrive. Okay, no binding. Next one. So it's, it's diffusion mixing, just basically a random sort of a process. Does that make sense? Okay. So we've got Large subunit, small subunit, mRNA, tRNA. Complex starts to assemble by small subunit, recognizing a specific structure in the mRNA. In bacterial mRNA, the structure is called shine dalgarno sequence, uh, obviously named after gentlemen's last names shine and delgarno it's a special it's it's kind of like a promoter okay it basically tells small subunit sit here we clear in eukaryotes most common one is five prime cap it's a special structure that is attached here called cap So far, does that make sense? So, the, the take-home message from that statement, there is a special structure in the beginning of mRNA which small subunit of the ribosome can recognize and bind to. Okay, we good? Yes. Great question. So let me sh let me explain. Genetic code is universal. That's one. This scheme of synthesis is uniquely prokaryotic because no membrane transcription and translation can happen practically simultaneously. tRNA basically universal so that codon and tie codon recognition it's the same in eukaryotes and prokaryotes does that make sense did I answer the, your question so <clears throat> you've got small subunit over here that recognizes shine dalgarno sequence in bacteria or five prime cap in mRNA then after the small subunit bound to mRNA, tRNA gets in the game and joins the complex. And the icing on the cake is the large subunit that completes the complex. So the order is small subunit binds mRNA, tRNA binds small subunit, large subunit joins the party. Small subunit binds mRNA, okay? tRNA with the first amino acid, which is metionine, binds to that whole story. And finally, large subunit completes the initiation complex. Does that make sense? Now, here, you can see the initiation complex. It's all assembled. You may notice that there are three delineated sites. They're called A, P, and E site. If you read them right to left, it's going to be APE. If you read them left to right, it's going to be EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. So each site has its own function. Usually, to kind of remember, 
what the function is, I explain it this way. A is attachment, B is peptide, E is exit. Now, how does the elongation, how does the protein synthesis work? So let's kind of scroll the story forward and look at the ribosome mRNA and the peptide and synthesis in the middle of a process. Does that make sense so far? Are you with me? So this is the middle of a process. You see tRNA in the P site with the growing polypeptide chain. Can you see that? This is the next tRNA coming over to the A site attaching. And this is tRNA from like a couple steps back that is kicked out of the ribosome. You see it doesn't have amino acid attached. Amino acid has been incorporated into a protein. So what happens during incorporation? This whole peptide chain is transferred over onto this new incoming amino acid. Does that make sense? When, don't worry, we're going to reenact it. When peptide chain is transferred, ribosome shifts. Now, chain peptide chain always ends up in the P site, peptide, and the empty tRNA is kicked out. I see very recognizable expression. What the hell is it talking about? We're going to reenact this whole story as long as I have enough markers, and I don't think I have enough. So I'm actually pause it and run to my office to grab a lot of markers. Okay. How does termination work? <clears throat> release factor gets into the A site. You see it release factor, it recognizes the stop codon. Does that make sense? Can you see the stop codon? Recognizes the stop codon and gets in the A site, breaks down the bond between the tRNA and the peptide. The peptide is released. Now, so we, we, we figured out the whole process, right? I think now it's much clearer. Now, a few comments. Uh, first, this whole thing requires energy, and it's pretty fast. So in E. coli, uh, the time that uh, is needed to incorporate one amino acid is 0.05 seconds. So one ribosome can make a hundred amino acid protein in five seconds, which is pretty cool. So you can imagine when you have dozens of ribosomes translating a si single message, the amount of protein that can be accumulated in a single cell is absolutely astounding. Okay? Now we got it. I'm going to make things a little bit more complicated, but it's kind of, it's a cool story. It turns out stop codon isn't always a stop codon. There is a stop codon, UGA, which sometimes encodes amino acid called selenocysteine. And the question, that first question is, how is it possible? how a stop codon can sometimes be a stop codon and sometimes encode amino acid. Now, imagine that you have a really, really, really long RNA molecule, okay? And the, that UGA is somewhere here. Now, you see there is a tail of RNA molecule that goes beyond UG. Does that make sense? Now this tail is not straight. There are multiple hairpin loops there. And if this tail contains a certain sequence that is called secis, 
selenocysteine insertion sequence. This sequence tells the ribosome, hey, this does not stop. This is actually codon for selenocysteine. So don't stop there. Insert selenocysteine and just move on. Does that make sense? Here, what I usually compare it to. Let me explain. Imagine that you're driving down the road and you see the sign, road is closed. And the sign doesn't completely block the road, it just stands there. What do you do? That's, that's, you're Russian for sure. I did that in Kent once. I drive down the road, there's a sign road closed. I, no, I gotta go there because it's a shortcut. It was fine. It was a little bit of a flooding, but I made it through. But generally, normal people, what, the, what will they do? They will turn around, right? Because the road is, there is a reason why it is closed, okay? Now imagine different situation. You drive down the road, there is a sign, road is closed. Behind that side, sign is the police car. And police officer signals you, keep going. Which means it's fine for now. Maybe they do some, you know, project there and all the heavy equipment is gone. So you can proceed right now. So who would you trust in this case? You would trust the police officer, right? You say, oh, that's fine. Sign doesn't really mean anything. So that that stop sign, that road is closed sign, is the stop codon. And that police officer is secus. That sequence that tells ribosome, keep moving, if not just keep moving, insert selenocysteine in there. Does that make sense? You just find this absolutely fascinating story. Um, now, we're going to take a break and we'll come back. We're going to do some, some lab activities.